In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. This is an amazing story, a beautiful story, and so much is packed into it. So much so that this story is associated with two seasons. It seems to make it into every Christmas pageant, even though this is the Epiphany story. The Feast of Epiphany tomorrow uh, will be when we tell this story, uh, but it's also one of the options for today. I do think as powerful as this story is, the way it in, is enfolded into our pageant both highlights some of its beauty and its poetic aspects I think in some ways it dampens the provocative nature of the story. So picture your typical pageant. For those who weren't here uh, 3 p.m. on Christmas Eve or for our school pageant, uh, we have all of the main characters all gathered here on the chancel. We have Mary and Joseph who's, who've been here since the beginning. The shepherds uh, are gathered around. They're uh, getting restless and uh, their sticks are getting a little bit more noticeable. Uh, the beautiful angels have swept in and are now dominating the landscape. Uh, more pictures seem to be taken of the little uh, angels than of Mary and Joseph who are still uh, holding uh, on to baby Jesus. So glad at this point that we decided to use a plastic baby Jesus this year. <laughs> That's about the context uh, when we hear of the three kings or the wise men. Uh, and there is absolutely no reference to them being kings. Really not so much to them being wise. And none to there being three of them. But as tradition goes, there's three. And it works out perfectly because after the first verse of We Three Kings, we can have them all come into their uh, special verse just for them. And so the first, uh, the first wise person with a crown comes down the middle uh, dressed elegantly to the words, gold I bring to crown him again, king forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. The gift of gold is laid at the foot of the child to signify that this will be a king, and not just any king, but the king of kings. And you're very glad that I'm not singing each verse, but the next one, frankincense. Incense owns a deity nigh, Prayer and praising, voices raising, worshiping God on high. The expensive frankincense is laid before the Christ child, recalling that this is a spiritual person. This is God incarnate. And frankincense was used in worship uh, and in prayer. He is a spiritual leader. And then to the next verse, Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom. Sorrow, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. Incarnation, our celebration of Christmas, is never absent the season that will come uh, in not too distant future, that Christ came and lived and gave his life, his whole life for us. Incarnation never separated from his suffering and death as they lay the myrrh that was used as ointment in preparing a body for burial. All gathered. And the tipping point, as the chancel is packed, is the reminder that they leave by another road. Usually the concluding point of, uh, of the pageant, that they leave by another road. And in that, we're encouraged to take our lives along a different channel, a different path, that we leave somehow impacted by this story, carrying God with us and leaving by another way. But it's also a reminder of that statement in our baptism, that all of those things, all of those powers which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God, a reminder that the world still has King Herod's, and there's never a mention of the slaughter of the innocent children or Joseph fleeing with his family of Egypt. But in that departure, we're reminded both of our responsibility to leave by another way and that we, leave, and that we live in a world that still has those powers that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. All of that is pregnant in our story. 
and our call is to let this story take root in us, to live a different way with the assurance that God is with us, even amidst those powers. Doesn't really seem like it needs anymore. It's a powerful enough story as it is, isn't it? Well, what else could there be? Well, follow me a bit. Uh, in our third grade Bible class, what we do is uh, we talk about how there's four different Gospels and why there's four different Gospels. And sometimes we'll use a hypothetical uh, playground incident and how a teacher might be trying to discern what actually happened on the playground uh, after the children came in in a, in a, in a clatter uh, talking about uh, each side's version of the story and how if the teacher interviewed four different students, they probably get four <laughs> different stories that laid upon each other might give you a sense of what actually happened or what it meant to each student from their perspective. And then if you waited a couple days uh, as people integrated the story and as their resolution started to take place, you get even different versions. But the beauty of it is that we have four different Gospels that not only give us an incredible account of what took place, but also what it meant at different points in history, at different places in history. And so we talk about our Christmas pageant uh, and how uh, there is no place that we can turn to in Scripture and run start to finish through our our pageant. That if we started at Mark, we'd realize that Mark, the first gospel, uh, pretty much presumes everyone knows the birth narrative and is concerned uh, with preparation for baptism. So he starts with Jesus' baptism straight into Jesus' ministry uh, and what it's all about. And then I'll skip to the last gospel, John, written the farthest into the future, who believes everyone knows the story, the nut and bolts, but what does it mean? And he has those beautiful words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and all things came into being through him. Uh, and that reminder that Christmas tells us uh, that a light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And then we have those two gospels in the middle that tell us the story, and that we integrate those two pieces together uh, to get our Christmas pageant. And uh, Luke is that uh, all of those pieces that Linus tells us is the true meaning of Christmas, um, the parts that make a good bit of the pageant, um, the, um, the coming to uh, the census in Bethlehem, the coming, the new room in the manger, the, um, uh, the, the child wrapped in swaddling claws and laid in a manger, uh, the shepherds coming. Uh, but Matthew has an important part to play. And it's better to start late in the first chapter of Matthew. Uh, I told the children that if they learned in English class uh, that if you're writing a story, the most important part is the hook. Uh, Matthew has the worst hook ever written into any story. Uh, and uh, I, I will read it for you. Uh, I won't read the whole thing for you because there is not time and you don't have the patience. But um, it is pretty amazing. This is how the greatest story we've ever heard is begun. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, of the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron. And I'm going to skip way down. Uh, this is several paragraphs further. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salalithiel, and Salalithiel the father of Zerah, I should know all these, Zerah b -b Babel, and... Um, I'm going to skip further till I can pronounce them. Um, Zadok, the father of Akim, and Akim, the father of Elud, and Elud, the father of El Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Again, there's a lot more if you want to read it on your own. Uh, but why do I take the time to write, read all of those generations? Because it is important to know that the lens that Matthew has is incredibly Jewish. Uh, he is uh, teaching uh, and, and, and sharing the good news with the Jewish community. He is uh, of Jewish origin, uh, and it is absolutely critical to him that they see Jesus as the fulfillment of the hopes of so many generations of Jews, that he is the Messiah from the stump of Jesse, from the house of David, the one they've been waiting for. He is the one. He is the one. But it doesn't necessarily mean what everybody thinks it means. 
He's not necessarily the one to restore Jerusalem to greatness or to shift the geopolitical realities of the world, but he is certainly and no less the one. Now, the wise men, commonly thought to be from Iran or, the far, or as far east as China, were astrologers. They weren't faithful Jews. And if there was one thing that uh, the Jewish tradition held on to tightly, it was that no matter how difficult life had gotten, uh, no matter how much persecution, uh, exile they endured, that they were particular, that they were God's chosen people. And he is telling a community that God has done something beyond their imagination, that God has opened up the doors and that these wise men from parts unknown, from far, far, far away, are brought into this story, are brought into God's embrace. These wise men from, uh, from far away were astrologers. They uh, used observations of the universe, not necessarily the Psalms and the, uh, the Torah to uh, make uh, sense of the universe. They even studied the entrails of animals, um, but they paid attention. They paid attention to what was happening in the world. And they noticed that creation was being altered, that something was different in the cosmos, that the whole universe was somehow different than it was before this event happened. Something was changed, and they began following this star so sure uh, that it would lead to something that would transform their lives. According to scholar Walter Brueggemann, these travelers, while not Jewish, were probably familiar with the poem from that 60th chapter of Isaiah written as people who had returned from exile to their beloved Jerusalem, found it in absolute ruin, and they were crushed. Their spirit was low, and they needed hope. And it was written by a poet who lifted people's spirits by writing about a restored Jerusalem that would bring travelers and kings from far and wide. He would uh, write that nations shall come to your light, kings to your brightness of dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. People are coming. You matter. Your place matters. This surely came to Herod's mind as they arrived. And it probably had a lot to do with the wise people stopping to ask directions in Jerusalem. It's a little bit like folks from Canada uh, following a great light, following a star uh, down to, uh, 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 to, to Springfield, Virginia, and getting almost there and seeing Washington, D.C., and thinking, that must be the place. <laughs> it certainly can't be Springfield. It's got to be Washington, D.C. We'll stop in Washington and ask, uh, and ask directions. But that's an important part of the story. The story is not taking place in the seat of power but a small backwater town some nine miles down the road. The sages and scribes knew it was not the fulfillment of that 60th chapter of Isaiah, uh, but of Micah 5 that we hear this morning. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephraim, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule Israel, whose origin is from of old. And so after hearing that, the wise men left and they arrived. They follow the star uh, to its completion. They arrive in uh, Bethlehem and they lay their gifts, which are possibly sh foreshadowing of his kingship, his divinity and his suffering and death, uh, but maybe just symbols of where they were from. Maybe just the finest things from where they came from laid in front of that Christ child. And what a tableau that makes. A tableau that reveals the breadth of what has taken place, that this child was drawing all creation to himself from the stars uh, to people from worlds away, breaking down divisions and breaking wide open the vastness of God's embrace. Maybe that Christmas story can't be told without us seeing those images as both signs of what is, is and what is to come, but also signs of God's intent in the breaking in of God's vision. We are coming to the season of not just light, but of encountering the light. And not just God breaking in, but us stopping to recognize that presence and letting it transform our hearts and our lives. So how do we mold these two, these two interpretations of this beautiful story into our lives? Three things that I'm going to hold on to. One is to take notice to open my eyes more widely. You know, I don't think that that star shone just for those wise people 
from the east. I think it shone for all, but only a few were observing. Open our eyes to see God's hand about us. Open our eyes to see God's opportunity, to see that vision uh, that God laid before us uh, possibly taking place or possibly uh, being able to take place. Two, stop and realize the whole breadth of it. Creation itself having been altered, shepherds in the inner courts, foreigners first at God's table, differences that this world creates being broken down. Take in the fullness of that vision that God has for the world. And three, leave by another way. Leave by another road. May this story, may your encounter with this story, with the living God, change you. You know what that inbreaking looks like. It's laid out beautifully for us in this story. You see God's dream. Can you leave here walking closer to that light by another road? Amen.